There's a storm rolling off the Pacific Ocean, and it's supposed to hit the Cascade Mountain Range later today. My goal is to hike high up into the mountains where I think there's going to be fog and hopefully some light rays. I'll show you guys some of my favorite camera techniques, and I'll also show you how to take an image and add fog and light rays to it in the scenarios where you don't actually have them in the field. I just got to the top of the summit, so highest place in this whole mountain range. You can see there's lots of snow on this side of the trees because all this air is blowing up over here. You can see there's ice crystals up on the branches. So that means this is getting hit with clouds and fog. You can see some of it blowing through right there. So I'm gonna look for a spot in this area and hopefully I'll get some fog rolling through. Great colors back here. Love all the colors of these dark red trees with the white magenta color on the ice. I still don't see anything that's really screaming at me. Wood photography is really hard. Just takes a lot of walking around and looking. I think these trees look real cool. I'm just trying to pick out like a center of attention. So I was looking at this one. It's not really that interesting, but I think those icy trees right there where all this light's coming in from this side and lighting them and all the dark trees around it. If I can manage to get a good angle at it, that's the really hard part. Sometimes when you're shooting in the forest, this might work. It's that tree right in there. One thing to keep an eye out for when you're shooting in the forest, if you see any chopped off like dead logs or old stumps, stuff like that right here. Let's see if there's any other ones that but like the really big ones that stick up in the photos those always ruin photos and if you're not looking out for them they can get in there and you don't see it because your screen's so small and then you blow it up once you get home you're like oh all right i'm gonna take a vertical one of the best ways to improve your forest photos is to add light rays or fog to them or both like i'm going to show you in this video so obviously capture it in the field if you can but if it's not there and you still have a good composition, it looks really good to add some effects in post-processing. So I'm going to show you guys how I captured this as far as shooting technique later in the video. But let's first cover how to add light rays and fog. If you're interested in getting free access to all my camera technique courses and photo editing courses, I have a 10-day free trial, which you guys can check out. Link down below this video. Let's get into the adventure. So first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to pre-plan what I'm going to do with this image. So I'd like to have some fog rolling through right in this area make it really light and diffuse back here. And then I'll really concentrate on all the details of all this ice in the foreground. I'd also like to add light rays coming in right back through here. So it'll kind of balance out the back side of this photo. And then the light rays will come through and hit all this over here. So the first thing, always kind of pre-visualize where you want the light rays and fog to be, and then do the editing off of that. So I'm going to make this a little bit cool as far as the color temperature, because if I have warm yellow or orange light rays, it looks really nice to have cool temperatures in the rest of the scene. You guys can check out Dave Morrow and Color Theory. If you Google that, my whole Color Theory guide will come up. This is called a complementary color harmony with yellow and blue. They lie across from each other on the color wheel. So I just made that dark. I'm going to leave the whole photo pretty dark because I'm going to be adding the lightness back here later. So I'll come down here to the curve and add a little bit of light. You can see it gets kind of weird looking. You want to stay away from that. So pull up a little bit of this and I'm going to crop this. So on one side of the image, I'll have the light rays and fog in this tree and the other side will be balanced by this area right here. So I'll put this tree right here about a third and this other tree about a third. Hit OK. So the composition doesn't look great now, but once I balance this with the light rays and the fog, it'll look a lot better. So I'm just going to hit open object and this will open it up into Photoshop for me. So the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a little bit of brightness to this tree. So what I'll do, I have a smart object here. I can go up here to layer, smart objects, and new smart object via copy. And then if I click on this, it'll jump right back into camera raw. So if you wanna be able to have this functionality for yourself, whenever you're in camera raw, just go down here, and then just put this color space in whatever color space you use. But the key here is to click open in Photoshop as smart object and then it'll always open in Smart Object for you and you can jump back and forth. So I'm just gonna watch this tree right here and I'm gonna pull up the lights just so I can bring some attention to this tree. Now the rest of the image isn't gonna look right. I'm just concentrating on the brightness that I want this tree. So I'll hit OK here. And then I'll come over here. I'm going to apply a black layer mask to the whole thing. Grab my brush tool here and I want it to be a white brush. And then I'll just make this brush fairly big 
flow 100, smoothing 100, opacity 50, and just do a few touches of light back on this tree. And then I'm going to do a few touches of light right here and right here. So this will kind of surround the foggy area. And then, of course, if you wanted to dial the opacity up and down, you can just darken it a little bit until it looks good to your eye. So somewhere right in there looks good. And then if you wanted to remove any of the brush, you could go back to your black brush. If you thought this was too bright, you could just darken it down just with a few clicks of black brush there. All right, so that looks good. The next thing we're going to do is add some slight fog back here. So I'm just going to hit this plus button. And I'll call this fog. And then I have a brush preset made for this. It's just called light painting. All it does is put the flow at 15, smoothing at 10, and opacity at 20. And then I'm going to use the color white because the fog is going to be white. You could use another color if you wanted, but for this scene, I'm going to use a really bright white. So now I just need to take my brush and I'm going to brush in the fog to make the light diffuse back here. I don't want to bring it into the foreground because I want the foreground to be contrasted and sharp. But anywhere you want the fog to show up, just click in the background. And then I'm going to go to blend modes here. And I'm going to put this on light and blend mode. And you can see the effect. So before, after, before, after. Now, if you wanted more of these, you could just hit command or control and J. And you could make more fog. Or you could delete them if you want less. So I'll just put two of those. And then I'm going to group these. So just right click and then we'll just go to group layers. And I'll call this fog. So now you could bring the opacity up and down and get it dialed in wherever you want it to be. So I'll leave it right there for now. So the next thing I'm going to do is make a brand new blank layer. So I'm going to hit shift alt command and E all at the same time. That would be shift alt control and E on a PC. Let's just merge all to new layer. So it takes all these layers underline and it merges them all to a new layer that looks just like them. So you can see if I turn this on and off, nothing changes. So you could do light rays a few different ways. One way that I found to do it really easily is just get the Skylum software. It's just by Luminar AI. So I just installed this on my computer and I've messed around with a few of the functions on this. I always like to try out different plugins. Most of my editing, I don't use plugins. All of my courses, I teach everybody just how to do stuff without plugins because it's a lot better to learn the skills before using plugins. But if you want to use some plugins, it can also help a lot. So I'm going to go down here on the side under tools to sun rays. And then it says place sun center. So you can see when I click that, it brings up this little circle. I'm just going to bring it over here and start turning up the amount. Now you could also bring it down here to one of these cracks, but generally it's really hard to get light rays like that. So generally I leave it out of the top and you can see it finds all the holes in the trees and pokes that light through. So then you have all these other settings that you guys can play around with. Overall look, I'm just dialing this in till it looks good to my eyes. Sun ray length. And then if you see it comes down into areas like this that you don't want, you can mask that out later. So we'll just leave this somewhere right in here and then penetration you just want to get that so it looks natural also keep in mind you can turn up and down the layer intensity once you're back in photoshop and then you can make it either brighter or darker back here so always go a little bit brighter than you need and then you can just back it down so maybe somewhere right in there next is sun settings so sun radius you can see that makes where the sun's poking through brighter or darker so this is just all personal preference Sun glow radius is just the glow that comes out from around the sun. Sun glow amount does the same effect, but it just has the radius in a smaller amount. Then you have ray settings, number of sun rays. You can just pull this around and it's just going to increase or decrease. So you just want to get it so it looks natural. So I'll just pull this somewhere right in there and then randomize also has the same effect, but it just randomizes where the actual sun rays come through. So when you're doing this, I always just bounce back and forth between all of them from amount down to the ray settings. So maybe right there. And then warmth is the actual warmth of the sunlight. So you could go from off. So it's like a white color, but I'm going to add some yellow into it. So it'll offset this blue for my complementary color harmony. 
So maybe somewhere right in there. So sun warmth is the actual sun up here. Ray warmth is the color of the rays coming out. All right, so after you get that all close, you can just start moving this around so it looks good. You can also move this around once you get that dialed in to see if you can get a better place. So do that for a while. You'll eventually get it dialed in so it looks natural. And once you have that, you just click templates here and then click apply. And that's going to just pop this right back into Photoshop. So now that we're in Photoshop, I'm going to label this sun rays. And you can turn this up and down from opacity to 100, down wherever you want it to be. That's why I always go a little bit overboard. And then you can also put a layer mask on it. And if the sun rays get down into an area you don't like, like down here, I'll just go back to my masking brush, flow 100, smoothing 100, opacity 50. And I'll get my black brush here. And I just want to make sure that it doesn't get down into the foreground too much. So I'll just make sure it's not coming anywhere that looks weird down here in the foreground. And then anywhere that's in the shadow, for example, somewhere back here that would be getting blocked, it's good to just take your brush through there so you don't have these unnatural sun rays coming through. Something like that. And then you can turn this on and off to get an idea if you like the underlying effect more. So over here, I like how there's a lot more contrast. So I'm just going to brush through here with my black brush because I don't want that sun ray layer effect over here because I like how all the trees look over here. So before, after. So I think that's starting to look good. So we can pull that back in there. So you can also just brush out any rays you don't like. So for these that are coming down into this area, if you just didn't like how it looked, you could brush some of those out if they just look unnatural to your eyes. And just slowly take your time until all that looks good. All right, great. So this is the overall effect for the base layer image. So you could just group this all into one. And I'll just call it base layer. And I just call that base layer because in an ideal world, I would have shot these conditions out in the field. And now you can start applying the rest of your photo editing to this actual process. So now that the composition's all dialed in, let's get through the settings. So for this one, I'm zoomed in pretty far. We're at 100 millimeters. And these trees are pretty close to me in the foreground. So even if I focus on these trees in the foreground down there, I don't think that tree is going to be sharp in the background. The really hard part about a shot like this is that both of these things are moving because that fog's just blowing through. So they're moving at different times and you have to take different shots for focusing on them. Now the hard part is they'll never line up perfectly. So ideally you want to get this all in one shot if you can. So I'm going to try it first by just focusing on this bottom branch coming in here, right here. And if that's not sharp, since that holds the whole bottom of the shot together, the rest of the shot's not going to work. So this has to be sharp. So I'm going to focus about a third into the bottom of the scene. So just cutting it up one third, two thirds, and putting it on that third right on that branch there. So I'll just zoom in using this OK button. It just zooms in at 100%. Back button autofocus, and then dialing that focal ring until it's perfect. Now. You can see it moving there. See that slight movement from the breeze blowing through? So you need a shot to fire off real quick to capture this one. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go with F16. I'm gonna see if I can get this all in one shot. I doubt it's gonna get that sharp and that tree sharp, but if it's even close, it's so much easier to take that single exposure, just freeze both of those versus layering them up when they're both moving. That's super hard to do. So always aiming for the easiest photo editing method first, and then that's gonna give me six seconds. So what I'm gonna do here, starting at base ISO or ISO 64, I'm just gonna push my exposure all the way up to the right. In dark wood scenes like this, it's extremely important to start with your exposure bright because you wanna capture as much light from the scene as possible. So the scene on the back of the camera is gonna look way brighter than this because the histogram is pushed all the way over to the white edge so I can capture all that dark detail down here on the bottom. If I would have done a regular exposure, say where my photo matched my scene, notice how that bottom left hand of the histogram, the blacks, is shifted way over towards black. If I expose to the right, you'll notice as I get brighter, my shutter speed gets longer. I'm capturing more light about from the scene. So I'm capturing more information from the scene, which I can throw away later, but I want to capture it all in the field and when I'm always looking at the scene, I'm saying shooting is about capturing as much information in the field as possible 
without blowing out or throwing any away. So if I can make the shot brighter without blowing it out, that's what I want to do. So all the way exposed to the right, that gives me 10 seconds for my shutter speed. Now clearly that's not going to work because this is moving all over the place, right? So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ISO and it's at 64 base right now. I'm going to start increasing that to 400. Actually, I'm going to go 500. My camera starts to really drop off in image quality around ISO 500 to Z7. But test your camera and see where that ISO max is where you really lose image quality. If you're shooting a dark scene like this and you need shutter speed, you're going to have to go up an ISO and you need to know where that max is. So if you hit it, you'll know the next step is to darken the image instead. So I went up to my max, size, my max usable ISO 500. I still have 1.3 second shutter speed. So now I have to darken the image down or open up the f-stop. But I want to cover this whole scene, if I can, in one shot. So I can't drop the f-stop. It's got to stay up high, f-16. So that means I have to darken the image down. So I'll just darken this down in exposure compensation. A stop and a half. That gives me a half a second shutter speed. That's probably still not going to be fast enough. I'm going to keep my eye on those branches right there. And when the wind stops hitting them, that's when I'm going to fire this off. I'm still going to put a two second timer on this because at this far zoom, it's really going to show all the shake. So I'll fire one off right there. That's the review. I'm going to look at the focal point first, which is right down here. And you can see it's always important to look at the focal point first because if that's out of focus, then none of the rest of the image matters. You can see that's really out of focus. Let's see if it kept it sharp back to the trees in the back. So f16 when i'm reviewing these trees in the back here they're still not sharp which means the depth of field for one shot even at f16 is not going to cover it so now i know that that's not going to work i'm going to have to focus stack this scene so that lets me know that i can go down an f-stop and i'll get a much faster shutter speed because i have to focus stack these anyway it doesn't matter if i decrease the f-stop so let's go to f11 that gives me a quarter of a second shutter speed and I'll zoom in, make sure my focus is good on these branches. And then fire that one off too. That's a quarter of a second. So that still might not be fast enough. And you can see the decision or logic tree I'm going through here. That's almost there. So they're still moving a little bit. Let's see how far back that focus goes. Make sure it goes back to my furthest away branch right here because if it doesn't I need to increase my f-stop to cover that now it gets everything sharp the focus starts to drop off back on those trees back there which I knew it would all right so now I have two choices I go up in ISO that's going to reduce my image quality I can't drop the f-stop anymore because if I do I'll lose that furthest away close branch so I have to go darker here to make that shutter speed faster to freeze those branches so I wanted to teach you guys two really important things here. And if you want to read further in depth on this, you can get my free PDFs that explain all my sharp focus techniques, my f-stop techniques, and my ISO techniques. And that's down below the video. So you can take it out shooting with you and it'll walk you through the step-by-step -step process. So as I described in that free PDF, whenever you're shooting out in the field and you have low light scenarios, it's much better to have a sharp and underexposed image than an overexposed or exposed to the right image that's not sharp. So this is the first shot I took and I focused right down here on these trees, and I had to make it pretty dark because I had to get this fast enough shutter speed to freeze these branches moving around. Then I just refocused everything else the same, but I refocused back here. And what you're gonna notice here is that even at ISO 500, if I zoom in here, I'm really underexposed, but I can take this exposure slider and notice how much dark detail I can pull out of this shot and there's hardly any image degradation, even at ISO 500. So always much better to underexpose and shoot it sharp than expose to the right and not have it sharp enough. Always just keep an eye on your shutter speed. Like I said, there's those free PDFs down below. You guys can read through those and it'll give you a really good understanding of this. Another trick you can use instead of focus stacking is you could zoom out a little bit. So I took this one at 54 millimeters and I visualized where I wanted the vertical crop to be inside the horizontal. So you can see this was taken at 94 millimeters. So the depth of field for 94 millimeters, I really have to increase the f-stop to f16 or I have to focus stack. But when I'm shooting f11 or f16 at 54 millimeters, everything's sharp from one single exposure because I'm zoomed out so much further. 
This is another thing that I explain in those free PDFs that I linked down below. As you zoom out and as your focal length becomes wider, the depth of field will actually increase for a standard set f-stop. So f-16 will have a much longer depth of field when I'm shooting at a wider focal length. So what I could do here is I could just crop this one down in to my vertical, something like this and that wherever it looks good to your eyes. I'll just do this quickly. And now you have one shot that's sharp for the entire image. And I don't need to use focus stack and I can just shoot at F16. So that's a really good trick you guys can use as well. So let's finish up on the camera technique. So those look good. So now I can concentrate on that tree back there. I don't have to worry about the foreground so much. This is where it gets hard because there's this overlap in depth from that thing that's poking out right there, that branch, and what's behind it that might be moving. So we'll see if we can do this. It's always an experiment, but if you walk yourself through the experiment and why you're making the decisions, then when you get back to the computer, you won't be wondering why you took which shots for which reason. And if it didn't work, well, at least you know you tried and you made the right moves on it. So that's why that's so important to walk through it like this. So I'm just gonna move my focal box back to that icy tree back there. Back button focus. And I'll dial my focal ring a little bit back and forth, just wiggle it to make sure that that back button focus nailed the shot. But I think it was as sharp as it gets right there. So I'm gonna keep all the settings the same here because I still need that fast shutter speed to freeze those moving branches. So every single shot I'm taking, I'm defining to myself what settings I need and the balance between settings and the image quality and what's actually going on in the scene. So that gets to be complicated until you learn how to do it and you're always just walking yourself through it. All right, so now I'm just checking the focal point again. That looks sharp. I'm gonna check the furthest thing in the scene. So I'm just scanning the scene, what's the furthest away? Back here, check that. That looks sharp. And then I wanna see how far down this focus goes into the bottom. Yeah, it goes right into those branches and then it stops like at the tips of those branches. So I'm gonna take one more that's just focused on the tips of those branches. This will be kind of be the in-between. And then I'll take a few different exposures here and then hopefully one of them will work. All right, so I just focused on that. I'm gonna go with F8 here, make sure it's super fast shutter speed. And then I'm just gonna take a bunch of shots there. So. Whenever you're shooting things that are moving in the wind, and when you're working on shutter speeds like this to control it, sometimes it's hard to see things that move in the wind on the back of your small camera screen. So if you're always just taking a few of them at each stop for each example, and then reviewing it, and we'll take another one there, and then kind of scanning through it and making sure all the different parts of the image you need for that exposure are lined up, then you'll know you'll be good when you get home because you can pick one of them and hopefully it's good. Sometimes it all just fails. Sometimes the composition fails after all this work, but we'll see once I get on the computer. 